Welcome Black. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, this session is about uh, the white flag. Actually it's about unconditional surrender. I hope you uh, are edified and encouraged by it, empowered by it, and stirred by it to respond to this challenge about waving a white flag and having an unconditional surrender to God, to his ways and his word. The biblical white flag, the concepts behind the biblical white flag, and, you know, what it means and, and uh, uh, what is implied by it. We have to make an informed decision and choice about this white flag. You know, I have to thank a young preacher friend of mine called Stephen. He lives on the east coast of the USA. And he uses a white flag as his profile picture on Facebook. When I first saw this profile picture, I didn't think it was a flag. I just thought it was a white square. And I thought... That's funny. Why does he use a white square as a profile picture? I mean, profile pictures make you instantly uh, recognizable, you know, on, on Facebook. And uh, his wife, who is the daughter of uh, a friend of mine, someone that I greatly uh, appreciate uh, and love in the Lord Jesus, uh, she changes her profile picture regularly, uh, but not this lad, this young preacher. He's He's got this sort of white square, which when I looked at it more uh, correctly, I realized it was actually a white flag. It's just that uh, Facebook had, had changed the resolution of it, uh, so all you could see was just a white square fitted into the, you know, the area that they allow you to put profile pictures in. So it just looked like a white square, but actually it's a white flag. And I began to think about this and meditate on it. Uh, mutter it over. Meditate means to mutter over. It doesn't mean to empty your mind and fill it up with New Age junk. <laughs> Bible meditation is that you meditate on his precepts, on his word. Hallelujah. You actually meditate about something. It's not Eastern philosophy. Meditating about nothing. Anyway, I meditated about this uh, white flag concept. And I'd like to pass on uh, some of these thoughts. I'd like to pass them along to you in the hope that you'll be edified and empowered by thinking about it. The white flag, as you can see in the picture. It's the universal sign of surrender. It's used universally everywhere in conflict of all sorts. When you put up a white flag, you're tossing in the towel. If you're in a wrestling match, you'd be thumping the uh, mat with, with your hand. It's a sign of surrender. I think that we all know that the, what the white flag stands for and uh, what it means is somebody waving a white flag or putting their hands in the air you know when you worship to God and you raise your hands in the air in adoration to him you're also surrendering to him you're putting your hands in the air I surrender I'm laying down my arms I'm laying down my rights to fight I'm surrendering well in that's what you're doing a white flag the banner over me is a white flag I used to sing that song, you know, his banner over us is love, his banner over us is love. Well, the banner over me is a white flag. I want God to see it. And I want my heart, mind, soul, spirit, body, being to realize that I have hoisted it up there. I keep it up there in all types of weather, fair weather, foul weather, <laughs> daytime, nighttime. It's probably getting a bit tattered now. Uh, uh, blowing stiffly in the breeze but nevertheless it is it's raised up because I am surrendered to 
the Lord, his word and whatever he wants to do in my life and with me. It will be according to his word, of course. Now here's an Old Testament account, uh, account of what it means to wave the white flag. To hoist it up. And so we're going to read it. You'll find it in 1 Kings chapter 20 uh, verses 1 to 4. And ben the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Benadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine, thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest, are mine. And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. Now, if you really want a good story, you want to read the whole of this story because Ahab was uh, shifty, to say the least. And you'll see that this is a story about the power of God and uh, Ahab and his, what he sets out and says he's going to do, of course he has no intention of doing. Just you make sure that when you raise a white flag to God, you're not going to pull it down or even uh, be deceitful. Put up a white flag when you don't really mean it. Anyway, in this case, 33 kings are united in a move that marshals a huge army against Samaria. Samaria were, you know, uh, up in the hills and uh, in the hill country and they just, well, they cover everything around. It's an overwhelming force, completely surrounded and cut off this fortified city. Massive, massive uh, Amada. If you've been standing on the battlements looking out, your view, you know, looking around for a 360 degree, you, you'd see a sea of armed foes that were stretching back into the distance. Wherever you looked, there were those arrayed against you. And the choice would have been clear. It's fight, fight and die or surrender, death or surrender, um, no sort of middle ground. Unless you mounted those walls to see for yourself, you might have been tempted to think that there was another outcome might have been possible. Maybe diplomacy would have won the day. But once you saw the situation as it was, you would have known in your heart that there was no other outcome other than death or surrender. And in a way, that's how we come with God. We, we hope for some sort of diplomatic solution. We hope that uh, there is something uh, good that's redeemable deep within ourselves somehow. We hope that somehow God wants to rescue some part of the Adamic race and, and nature. And we hope that, uh, you know, there's more than one way to please God or more than one way to God. As if it, uh, it, it doesn't come down to sort of black and white, right and wrong, evil and good, heaven and hell, righteousness and sin. 
In fact, uh, we sort of, in ourselves, we want almost anything except this ultimatum. We don't like ultimatums. Ahab, fly the white flag now. Surrender all that you have now. All that you are now. Ahab, you belong to me. I'm amassed against you with a force and a power you can't possibly match or meet. So get on with it. Ahab, you no longer belong to yourself. All that you are, all that you have belongs to me. Fly the white flag and surrender immediately. That was a clear message on that day. It should be a clear message to us. The one who died for us, rose again from the dead, is now the Lord of life. And we're to come to him and confess him as Lord. In fact, it's part of salvation, isn't it? Uh, with the mouth we confess that Jesus is Lord. We put up a white flag and surrender to him. Because he, he died for us. Because we're incapable of saving ourselves. Because we were uh, doomed through sin to destruction and damnation. Because uh, uh, of sin, we were justly uh, condemned and sentenced to everlasting damnation in hell. And the only escape, the only way for us, is that Jesus dies for us and raises from the dead in power. But he comes out at the other side as the Lord, and we confess him as Lord. And so... We happily, cheerfully, humbly thank God for his mercy, his help and his forgiveness and we fly the white flag of surrender and we say all that I have is thine. In our story, who is this humble king? Well, he's an evil king. He's eventually conquered by an instrument of judgment in the hands of God. In this case, he buckles under the might of a vastly superior forces arrayed against him. I don't want to get into the rest of the story because God demonstrates his power, but to him, but the reason that God demonstrates his power to us is really on twofold. One, to tell us that really we have no other alternative but to surrender a white flag, but two, to assure us that his power will work on our behalf to make that surrender effective and complete. So we don't have to trust in our own ability, we trust in his ability in us to affect our surrender and to maintain it for us. Now notice the tone of the scripture. This king, sitting in his walled and heavily fortified city, was surrounded by a vastly superior force of arms. Yet he had the common sense to realize that he was besieged and surrounded and that there was no escape. It was inevitable. If he resisted, he would be pounded. This is an example of surrender. Now this is not just any old surrender. This is complete and utter surrender. This is unconditional surrender. You know, just get the tone of the messengers to him, you know. All that you have, your gold, your wives, your children, your possessions, you, you, all of you, everything you have, everything you are, every, everything you intend to be, all of your amb ambitions, your hopes, uh, everything you aspire to, all your talents, you belong to me, the king said. 
backed by his endless sea of armed men, heavily armed men. A modern, for its day, a modern, well-equipped army. Unconditional surrender. It's important that we realize that this is not a treaty. This is a surrender. There is a big difference between unconditional surrender and a treaty. In today's idea of, of all men being equal and everything being fair, we form treaties. But God doesn't form a treaty with us. He calls us to an absolute surrender. The old nature, the part that we of us that we get from being born of Adam, human beings, is to be brought to an end on the cross. There is no place in heaven for the old nature, for the flesh, for the body of sin. That's why we have to be born again. That's why we have to be born again, made over, made new, translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. It's not a treaty. And the only way that we can enjoy the fullness of this new life is to leave the old life, to surrender it, and to surrender over to God because the new life only lives in the presence of God. Surrender to him. God doesn't have partners and equals around him. He has subjects. <laughs> and I'm one of his subjects. I belong to him. I've been brought with a price, actually. In unconditional surrender, the one who surrenders loses all possessions, rights, powers, and becomes at the mercy of the one that is surrendered to. That's the principle. When you wave the white flag, that's what you're saying. I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm not going to stand against you. I'm not going to. I'm not going to try and withstand you in what you're doing in my life and what you want to do with me. I am giving over and asking you to be my Lord. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to walk in your steps. I'm going to do those things that please you and not the things that please myself. I'm going to seek your will and not my will. I'm putting a white flag up. Unconditional surrender to God is, one, is the one thing that's so desperately needed today. I think it's appalling what is happening into what is called the emerging church. I don't know. I'm certainly not part of the emerging church. I hope you're not. Uh, I'm not mixing. I don't believe that all roads lead to God. I don't believe that everybody is right. I don't believe that everybody has a bit of okay in them. I don't believe in finding a middle ground. I believe in the truth. And I believe that anything that isn't the truth is a lie. I believe that doctrine is important. I believe in contending for the faith that once was delivered to the saints. I believe in resisting fables and man-made doctrines. I believe in extolling and lifting up the word of God. I believe that doctrine is most definitely important and I'm accountable for it. Unconditional surrender to God is desperately needed. God is not our servant. We don't order him around. And when you're walking with God under his blessing, you may abound in the things of this world and you may be abased in the things of this world. Gain is not godliness in itself. Are you willing to surrender yourselves unconditionally into his hands? That is the big question. 
We hear a lot about in the last decade, a couple of decades, unconditional love. People like to talk today about unconditional love. I think this is a very misunderstood term, unconditional love. Unconditional love is seen to mean that the person being loved has no conditions or responsibilities placed on them. The trouble with unconditional love is it does as it's seen today, it doesn't change the person you are loving unconditionally. There used to be a saying that went something like this, you love the person you hate their sin, but somehow uh, unconditional love has come to mean you love the person and you accept their sin. And if you don't like that term, we'll say we, you accept their weakness or their inabilities or whatever, their faults, their failings. Unconditional love doesn't change anything in the person that you're loving. I mean, the scripture says that if you love someone, you're going to chasten them. If you love somebody, you're going to tell them the truth. Here today you see all sorts of things about, oh, you, you sh Christian shouldn't judge. Well, I, I, a Christian shouldn't judge. No, you should judge as you're judged. You shouldn't be uh, hypocritical in it, but you most certainly have to make judgments. I won't go into that now. But if you think that uh, Christianity isn't uh, is totally unjudgmental, uh, what planet are you living on? The very reason that Christ had to die for us was because uh, God was uh, had to judge us. And the reason he can forgive us is because the judgment's been placed on his son. Is God's love unconditional? Well, what do we mean by this? I want to tell you something. God loves everyone, but unfortunately people who are loved by God are still going to go to hell. Unfortunately, as a great part of the so-called Christian body of believers, if you call them believers today, who don't think that hell exists, that surely a loving God wouldn't send anybody to hell, well, hell does exist, and heaven exists. They're not just some sort of mystical one. I want to go to heaven. And I thank God that I, there is a way of escape from going to hell. But it is in in receiving Jesus Christ. It's, it's within calling upon him. God in his unconditional love sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die and rise again. There's no doubt about that. But the only way to benefit from God's love, his unconditional love, is to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. To believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and to confess with your mouth that he is Lord. after you've repented. As far as receiving benefit from the love of God, it is most certainly conditional. There's no, there's no benefit to you that God loves you unconditionally unless you receive Jesus Christ as your own personal saviour. Biblical salvation through grace. Yes, you don't deserve it, but you've still got to receive it. And you've got to have faith. And you've got to put your trust in the Lord. And you've got to come to him. In the name of Jesus. Unconditional love. You know we shouldn't be concerned about unconditional love really. What we most certainly should be concerned about. Is unconditional surrender. I wish there was as much said today about unconditional surrender as it is about unconditional love.
God expects your surrender, your unconditional surrender, your unconditional surrender to him. He expects it. He wants it. He insists on it. Our unconditional surrender means our unconditional surrender to his work in us, around us, through us. Our unconditional surrender to his way and his ways and his the way he looks at the world and the way that he views everything and what his his word is, you know, his opinion, if we can use that term, you know. Our unconditional surrender to his word and what he says in his word, what he lays down in his word, what his true doctrine is, our unconditional surrender to his lordship and sovereignty over our lives. Actually, I don't like the word sovereignty, but anyway, it's in there, but it's not a good word. He is the almighty God. Sovereign has to do with a, a, a king of a worldly realm. He's more than that. Actually, his ministry is in heaven. Hallelujah. He, he, when he comes back to this earth, he will be uh, the ultimate ruler of this earth. But uh, now he wants to be the ultimate ruler in our lives. And he is totally committed against uh, the ruler of the powers of the air. Hallelujah, <laughs> he is. He wants us to unconditionally surrender to him. The mighty thing is this. God accomplishes our surrender. You know, if we, if we, if we want it, if we desire it, he will bring it about. He will bring it to pass in us. Isn't that wonderful? He is the uh, high priest of our confession. Didn't God say to Pharaoh, For this cause I have raised thee up, for to show thee my power? That's the very reason why I'm surrendering to him, because he's so ultimately powerful. If you read in Exodus 9.16, And in every deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. And if God said that of him, will not God say it far more of you? So yes, he raised up Pharaoh, uh, showed him his power, and he comes to us, and shows us the power of God, not just in creation, but in the cross and the virgin birth and in the resurrection. Hallelujah! He shows us his power. And the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We, our only response is <laughs> to wave the white flag and to surrender before it. The fact is that God raises us up to show us his power. Lucifer tempted man and we lost our place in the kingdom of heaven. But God shows his power and he can righteously, rightly and justly place us into the kingdom of heaven. And if he's prepared to do that, surely he'll give us all things. And he'll also perfect in us the ability to keep that white flag up in reality. So that we are surrendered to him. We don't take our lives back. You know, we don't argue and fight God and, and deceitfully uh, move with him. We walk in righteousness and faith before him. Humbly... Uh, receiving of his merciful hand the power to live this Christian life. Hallelujah. The resounding fact is that 
the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he's able to legally forgive us individually and cause us to be born again of the Spirit is an open declaration and demonstration of his almighty power. It is. Hallelujah. And if you willingly raise that white flag up, he will be the source of your surrender. You know, he he will uh, maintain you and maintain your surrender. Glory to God. He shows his power openly to the devil and the forces of darkness. His angels stand in awe of his triumphant power and his return to collect his people is only the confirmation of his almighty power. But we can know his power now in our lives because when we raise a right flag up and we say that we're surrendered to you, Lord, he comes into our life and helps us maintain that and uh, and actually live it. Glory to God. God accepts your surrender. But we often fear that we're going to fail in our surrender. Maybe you have surrendered to the Lord many times, and then you've gone away and failed. Well, don't despair, because, you see, it's true that we're not placed in a forcible prison with walls and guards to make sure that we stay surrendered. We don't, you know, we don't have to be reminded by, as it were, a punitive uh, conquering force, uh, an occupation into our land. No, we willingly surrender. Our surrender is always, in this life, a voluntary one. In the past, we started with great intentions, but maybe we've rebelled, refused, and taken up arms again. Well, that's unfortunate, but that is not habitual. That is not inevitable. No. You can raise that white flag. You can totally surrender to the will of the Lord in your life. Yes, you can, and he will help you maintain it. Because he'll give you the power, the desire. It's him who's in our life. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. We fear failure of not being able to perform the surrender we promise. I tell you, Ahab didn't even on Skerrick perform the surrender he promised. But we don't have to be like him. We can perform the surrender we promise because he is our life. Hallelujah. <laughs> He's our surrender. Because he surrendered to the will of God, the Father. He lives in us so that we can surrender to the will of the Father. That's why he gets all the glory. Not me. Not you. But remember, he is our strength. Remember, there was once a man to whom Christ said, you know, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And so he said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Lord, I surrender. Help me with this surrender. Hallelujah. Mark 9, 23, 24. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. All right. Wave the white flag and say, Lord, see, look, I'm waving the white flag. I totally surrender to you. (laughs) Now, Lord, I need you. I need your mercy and your strength in my life. For me to keep this surrender going while I live my daily life in this sin-sick world. God maintains your surrender. Such a life has two sides. One side, absolute surrender to the work that God wants you to do. And on the other side, to let God work what he wants to do. Amen. Yes. 
I mean, the one right I suppose that Christians have is not to exert their rights. It's what turn the other cheek and all these things are about. Surrender to let God work in you. Surrender so that you'll do what God wants you to do. It doesn't make you less a man because it takes God to be a man that, uh, like God wants. It takes Christ in us to be a Christian. We can't do it on our own. Know what God wants you to do and then come and say, I give myself absolutely to God to let him work in me to will and to do of his good pleasure as he's promised to do. God blesses you when you surrender. What Ahab said to his enemy, King Hebedad, he said, My lord, O king, according to thy word, I am thine and all that I have. Shall we not say this to our God and loving father? Never mind what that king meant. Shouldn't we say to the Lord, According to thy word, I am thine and all that I have is thine, it belongs to you? If we do say this, God's blessing will come on us. Yes, it will. God wants us to be surrendered to him without any ifs, buts or maybes. Do you think that you don't have the power to do this? Philippians 2.13 For it is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Whatever God requires us to do, he also enables us to do it. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I find power and blessing in that verse. God's callings are God's enablings. Sounds trite and, and silly, but it's so true. If you wave the white flag to God, he will enable it to come to pass. Glory to God. You see, we take two looks at the cross. The first time we see Christ dying for us, and the second time we see ourselves dying with Christ. Both need faith, hallelujah, and trust and it's the Lord that works in us the power of glory are you ready to unconditionally surrender hmm? to let your surrender be absolute to absolutely surrender to God absolute surrender total and complete surrender Surrender without any conditions, provisos, side bits, footnotes, side notes, provisions. Just absolute surrender. Surrender and nothing else. Is your unconditional surrender, is it going to be yours? Is it, is it what you're going to do? No one else can do it for you. Isn't this funny about having a godparent, you know? You can't have godparents. <laughs> We've got our Heavenly Father and, and we're his, his, his children. Glory to God. And he is the boss. The Lord Jesus is our boss. We're not partners, as it were. It is your absolute surrender to God that God requires of you. Yes, it is. Are you willing to surrender yourself absolutely into his hands? I mean, that's the crux of the matter. Because now is the time to raise the white flag. Raise a white flag of unconditional absolute surrender. thing about raising a flag up as a banner is that everybody can see it. Not only the one you're surrendering to, but everybody else sees it. Oh, he's got the white flag up.
Will you raise this banner up right now? Will you tell our Lord that you unconditionally surrender to him, whom to know is life eternal? Will you raise up the white flag and be done with it? Will you give up and give in to him? This is the burning question. And I hope that you're stirred enough to say yes and to raise that banner high, a white flag that's uh, there declaring your intention. Hallelujah. And if you do, and if you are one who has the white flag flying, you'll be blessed. And God bless you and keep you as you keep rejoicing in him, knowing him who is eternal. Glory to God. Being cheerful and rejoicing that your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life and that you have the best boss in the world and you gladly submit and surrender absolutely to him. Unconditional surrender to God all the way. So God bless you and keep you. And whatever you do, keep rejoicing. Amen. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah.